Uh, today's paper is determinants of ETF liquidity in the secondary market, and uh, it's going to be presented by Mr. Alan Doherty and Sean Hutchinson. Um, over to them. Yeah, as, uh, as mentioned, we are Alan Doherty and Sean Hutchinson. We are the co-founders of Indy Financial Group Incorporated. Um, ETF uh, background information. Uh, ETFs came about in the early 1990s, around 1993. Um, the Spider Index was added. Um, up until 2000, there were about 300 added and it has exponentially increased up to now at about 1,000 uh, ETFs. At the time of the article, there were 884 ETFs at, evaluated at about $480 billion in assets. Um, at the time of the article, about 75% of the ETFs traded had been in existence less than five years. Due to the short period of existence, only a small amount of the academic research had been conducted. Um, problems arising from this are that over time and increasing to the 884 ETFs, there's been a lot of duplica duplication. Um, this could serve as a tool for issuing firms to gain market share. Um, by adding more of the same type ETF, they can get more, more people into their, their ETFs. Uh, the authors think that an ETF redundancy problem may be germinating and was already a crowded asset, asset type space. This in turn may create liquidity problems among the available funds. Um, and the high authors hypothesize that many of the newer funds will tend to be smaller. Um, they'll have lower trading volumes, and lower trading volumes means that they have to cover with higher expenses or higher expense ratios. Um, and this also ca causes wider bid ask price prices or bid ask price spreads. Yeah. <laughs> Lack of liquidity could be caused by the market as a sign that some ETFs could underperform the aggregate of their underlying assets once all trading costs and management fees are factored in. If an ETF continues to have lower liquidity, it may be a signal from the market that the security does not serve as a tool for completion. Larger funds that have lower bid-ask spreads and lower expenses, which should make them more attractive, um, particularly for large trades. Large firms are only interested in liquid assets that they can uh, have larger trades. Why liquidity matters. Um, basically, a fundamental goal of an ETF is to stay in line with the asset net value. So it should be close to what the value of all of the assets in it um, are. However, the cost of operating the fund make them not exactly the same. Uh, lack of liquidity makes it difficult for market makers uh, to execute buy, buy, sell transactions in a timely fashion, which undermines the fundamental goal by allowing the ETF to trade at a significant premium uh, or a discount to the net asset value. Consequently, the bid-ask spread widens to compensate for the market maker's willingness to bear that time lapse risk. So it's a ponding effect basically as the bid ask spread gets bigger, it keeps getting bigger um, because there's less liquidity. Many newer exotic funds may seem intriguing, but low liquidity levels make it difficult to obtain reasonable pricing in periods of market upheaval, especially for institutional investors with large positions. Um, going back to the basic of what liquidity is and why it matters, um, basically it's, it's the ability to convert an asset to cash quickly, um, also known as marketability. So you need to be able to sell your product 
or your, your security when you need to sell it. If you can't sell it, it's basically worthless. Um, the author's motiva motivation was to solve or look into the problem that the investors need to be able to determine uh, how liquid a security is and compare it to liquidity of other potential securities. There's no specific liquidity formula. There appears to be a number of interacting variables. In this case, we're looking at five interacting variables. Um, the first one's the bid-ask price, the dip which is the difference between uh, the highest price that the seller is willing to, the buyer is willing to pay for an asset and the lowest price for which the seller is willing to sell it. Size, the ETF's dollar value of assets under management. Uh, the expense ratio, uh, which is measure of operating costs determined by dividing operating expenses by the average dollar, dollar value of assets under management. Uh, the annual turnover, which is the percentage uh, rate at which the ETF replaces its investment holdings on an annual basis, and the average volume, which is the amount of securities traded over a specific uh, amount of time. In this case, it was over a three-month period, and it was the daily average. Um, so, so there, yep. I can just go back there. A couple of like tangential things on that. These are like the, the vitals of, a, of, a, of an individual. So, of course, there are many others. But suppose a person just suddenly gets wheeled into the ER, you know, so you know, immediately do a couple of things, you know, check the pulse, check the temperature, you know, the blood pressure, uh, the pupil dilation, and a couple of things like that. So, so I'm suddenly presented with, I don't know, how many were there? 1,100, 700 ETFs. Like, how do I know, you know, what, which will give me a quick indication of which is more liquid or less liquid? And so these are some of those primary factors. A tangent on a tangent. Item number three, hopefully all of you are keeping an eye on it. And that is where I will see whether you've done your work on the final project. I want to know the expense ratio of each of your ETFs that is there. It's not hard to find. It's there actually on a Yahoo page. It's called TER, the total expense ratio. Because the total expense ratio, those are the, those pennies, I've said this before, that are being sucked in by the giant vacuum cleaner that the financial funds operate. Net net, the expense ratio is coming out of your back pocket. Hopefully you're interested in that. Okay, so the authors um, set up a DOE to check the hypothesis that, that they created. Uh, the sample size for the study was reduced from a population of 884 ETFs at the time of the study to 418 based on the number of ETFs with greater than one year, one year of data available, the number of ETFs that reported all five of the variables uh, to be studied. So most of the ETFs at that time um, had not been in, in existence, and um, they did not have data uh, to cover all five variables. Um, looking at this, the descriptive statistics, um, we could see large differences between the mean and median. That automatically shows there was a dispersion um, And then there were large major, or major differences between the larger and smaller ETFs and volumes. For instance, if you look at the bottom of the graph of the table there, you have 222 versus 2.85 uh, million uh, shares being traded. Um, so the smaller, smaller ETFs were really, really small compared to the really large uh, ETFs. And I'm going to switch with Sean, and he can illustrate. Well, just go back. Sean, you can yeah. go back just on one slide, yep. just do that. <coughs> I, I'm not, I don't know if everybody in the class is, is sort of has a handle on what big ask is and why is it even a deal, you know. If you think of it, you know, they're not, fine as the capital markets in one place, it's a unique place and with a unique situation. The same asset, 
simultaneously has two prices. There are not many markets where that happens. It's the real estate market is one other place where it's there. The house that is on the market, you know, there's a, there, there's a selling price and a buying price. You know, one is, you know, for, from, 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 you know, depending on, on which side you're operating from. The same thing here, like at the same instant in time, if you want to buy a stock, you're buying it higher at the ask. If you want to sell it, you sell it lower. And it's always like that. If you want to buy, it's higher. If you want to sell it, it's lower from you. And that's the big ask. So it's actually non-intuitive. The ask is at which you want to buy, and the sell is uh, the bid. You know. And the spread between the two is the bid aspect. Naturally, if that spread is wider, there's a problem, and that's how the money is made by the trader. Yes. So I'm going to go over the correlation matrix of liquidity determinants. Um, we can see here that we have uh, all five variables across the top um, and, it's, and all five down the side. We see here that we see a negative correlation between size and volume with bid-ask spreads, um, meaning that as companies get larger in size, the bid-ask spreads typically decrease. Um, same with volume. More volume means lower bid-ask spreads. We do see positive relationship between expense ratios from Morningstar and, and bid-ask spreads. Um, and we also see a slightly positive relationship with annual turnover and bid-ask spread. However, p-value of 0.25, um, insignificant. The positive relationship between the Morningstar expense ratio and the bid-ask spread is, the English translation is double vanity, right? That means ETFs that have a higher expense ratio, they also have a higher bid-ask spread. So you want to buy something, you're going to buy it at 101, and you want to sell it, you're going to sell it at 100. So the specialist, specialist takes more portion of, 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 of the total trade there, and also you're paying a higher fraction of the cost of that uh, asset to the management company, which is not a good thing. And we can look at some of the distributions here. We see uh, three normal and two positively skewed distributions. We see a, a normal distribution for bid-ask spread, size, as well as volume. But we see a positively skewed distribution for um, expense ratio and annual turnover. When we look at the scatter plots graphed here, we can see that bid-ask spread and size are negatively correlated with a, with a tight distribution around the mean, um, as well as um, volume is negatively correlated, as we said before. Um, but we see a slightly positive with expense ratio, um, less tight we see some outliers above as well as below the line and on either tail. Um, and with the annual volume we see a flat distribution with quite a few outliers, um, really no conclusive interaction. This is the basic algorithm that uh, the authors use to rank um, the different factors or the different ETFs by factor, um, excuse me. The basic algorithm is a Newton algorithm which is a, looking at the derivative function um, between a certain set of limits in order to iter iterate across the five different factors and solve for zero on the derivative. Um, Pank might touch more on how the formulation of the algorithm actually works in the Excel solver, but this is a basic equation. Basically, guys, it's, uh, you know, someday if I have a little bit of time, I can, I can, I can pull this up. It's, 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 a, it's a ginormous Excel spreadsheet with all kinds of things in it. But here, uh, Josh, you see, here. this, what we are doing is, so if you think of, just, just imagine there's a bunch of columns, okay? Then towards the end, there's a correlation between so here we're maximizing the correlation. Then this I put in the objective function. I showed you the solver. So it had max, min, you know, or set at a rate. So I said, okay, maximize the correlation between, so there's a comma here somewhere, between one of the five factors. So here are five factors, one, two, five. It's, it's sort of hard to see, but you can see in your own paper. So whatever is the ranking that I get of, uh, of the liquidity, and, oh, I'm sorry, whatever bid ask I have. So bid ask is my primary driver. Bid ask and the other factors. And then 
and then I do it for one ETF, uh, but I have data going going for a certain time, and then I repeat the whole thing. So for all this, this is a symbol for for all J, which is an element of set, set e, uh, of so all ETFs. And in the end, I basically I, we, we get a liquidity rank, which has a high correlation with the bid ask square, and uh, so it, so we maximize the correlation by changing the weights also, and then. The liquidity score is think of it as as a sum product. So the liquidity score is suppose so there are five factors: is 0.5 times the first factor plus 0.3 times the second factor. So it changes the weights until I get a maximum correlation, you know. and that's how I get the vector of weights. There. But I don't care for the vector of weights. Eventually, what I want to see is what my liquidity score is for each of them, and it, it'll probably be more interesting to us. To see, you know, the set of ETFs that get pops out in the in the it was actually an eye opener for us. Got some bond ETFs for that. Yeah. So, in conjunction with that, is the linear least square estimator model function um, estimated based on the five factors? Um, you can see the coefficients estimated uh, across. I don't know if you can actually see that on the screen, um, but again, size, size, annual turnover, and, vol and three month volume are negative in the equation in the least squares estimator. We also see below when we use the AC rank liquidity score and we compare it to the bid ask spread, we see a positive correlation with an R squared on the entire model, not just on that one particular relationship, but of on the entire model of adjusted 0.79 R squared, meaning that 79% of the variation for the liquidity score is explained to by these five model, five factors within the model. So there's still 21% of the variability that is explained by that epsilon that we were talking about earlier in class. So the results of the ranking system. Um, liquidity was deciled and averages were calculated. Most liquid ETFs had low bid-ask spreads, high market cap, low expense ratios, and high average trading volume with really no pattern between liquidity, liquidity and turnover. If you just transition, you know, from, you know, you saw an algorithm there, and now you see this very nicely how they've organized these bullet points. Intuitively, don't you think, like George Bernard Shaw said, you know, common sense is uncommon. Well, you see common sense there, hopefully. Wouldn't you like to have an ETF which has a low bid as spread? You buy something for $101, you change your mind after 30 minutes, you know, you sell it for 100.95, you know. You lost five cents, but, you know, that's about it. It's high market capitalization, so if you want to sell 100 million shares, 10 million shares, it has no market impact. It has a low expense ratio. So it sort of, and it has high average trading volume, it sort of links to market capitalization. So it was sort of an, uh, we saw a little bit of an, an elegant outcome of this experimentation that, you know, the liquid ETFs had desirable uh, 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 finance properties, you know, which you would relate to. So here we can see a, a chart of the different uh, variables associated with the most liquid to the least liquid, liquid assets. Um, you can see number one had an extremely low bid ask spread, 4.87, huge market cap. You know, what is that? Four billion. Four billion. Four billion. Five hundred twenty-five million. Yeah, yeah, look at that, guys. So there are ETFs with a median market cap of four billion dollars, and in that same space you have things that are eleven million dollars that are trading. And look at the difference in the bid ask spread. So that's 4.8 versus 52. You know. yeah. Yeah. And that's just down to number nine. That's not even the least liquid. Oh, oh the, yeah. the least liquid is 74.66 on a bid ask and 5.8 5 5 million, million on a market cap. And then we look at the expense ratio. We see uh, low expense ratio for liquid assets, higher 1.21 expense ratios for least li liquid um, ETFs, we, also, we see very little um, trends in the annual turnover. I mean, 4.78 for the least liquid, least liquid, 4.8 for the most liquid. So really no change between top and bottom there. Um, average trading volume, though, we see a huge difference, 13 million in change for the uh, most liquid and 5,000 on the bottom. So not and even... 5,000 shares. I mean, you could own 10,000 shares in something that trades $50, you know? Mm -hmm. So... You would have a market impact. Yep. 
So therefore, large institutional investors really should focus on larger ETF products when the positions are required because you're handcuffed if you go on the bottom end. You, you can't get rid of it if you wanted to. John, just once again, just go back. You're doing great on time. I mean, this is because I. I really appreciate you guys trying to focus on these things. I know there are a lot of numbers. I mean, I, as you know, I, I've done this. But I want to give you a flavor of that. I want, I, I want you to think about the dimensions. Let me, let me give you a flavor of the dimensions here. Here's the total expense. That's 0.2% per year. So you got $100,000 invested. So 1% of that is what? 1,000? The 0.2% means you pay $200 a year for investing in the SPY, literally. By the way, you never write a separate check for $200. It's built into the NAV, the price of the ETF. Look at the worst one. What is the difference, you know, guys? 1%. 1,000 bucks. Between the best and the worst on the expense ratio. Let's move on over to the bid ask spread. What do you think the 74 basis point means, you know, in percentages? What is that? Three quarters of a percent. 0.74 percent. So once again, to, to make it real, you buy an ETF for $101, and let's say it's 100 basis points. The worst case scenario on average is that you're selling it for $100 right then. You buy it for 101 and you flip it at 100. And that, that is huge. In this world, it is huge. In both the cases, what is the spread? It's basically 1 percent. The difference between the best and the worst is 1% more in expenses and 1% more in the bid ask. And people think that 1%, half a percent is chump change, and that's why I keep talking about the giant vacuum cleaner. It just sucks in the constant supply of nickels, dimes, and pennies. So just keep that in mind, guys. And you know, once you compound that, how many of you, I know, I, know, I don't want to put, uh, put any of you on the spot, but I know some of you saw that video that I placed at the beginning of the semester. Um, and I showed, I think, in class, a 1.5% a a annual expense on a $100,000 investment. After 30 years, you're gonna be, lo you're gonna be left with $35,000. That's the power of compounding negative 1.5% a year. You're talking 2% right away off the bat here. You know? And we are not even including trading costs or taxes here. This is big stuff. I mean, not just this, this, this whole business of the fees and expenses associated with financial instruments is big stuff. And there is not a separate line item on that on the monthly brokerage statements that you get. How about that, guys? What you're paying for, the cost is not even shown to you. And there's huge lobbies in DC that don't let that happen. So the top 50 liquid ETFs, um, most of them have five years of trading history. Um, 35 of the 50 started prior to 2003. So the, the first in the market really captured the market. 45 of 50 were over a billion dollars in market cap. 17 of the 50 were over five billion in market cap. Um, 25 different style categories. And 11 of 50 were based on bonds. Four of the top five were also based on bonds, fixed income assets. So the bottom 50, they were specialized market segments. Most are relatively newer. Um, they had high bid ask spreads, low market cap, low trading volumes, and high expense ratios. And they su suggest that the market is efficient enough to recognize these undesirable traits. So as we just saw, Nobel Prize in efficient markets, um, some of this research is proving that. In fact, at least one group in our class is living that, right? Boy, do you want to talk about what, what, what is your idea? What group are you in? Oh, GTM. Yeah. So Bob and Shane, they had an ETF, which was highly, highly specialized. And what happened? Stop trading. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on the market. They had in the pool of stop trading. They created homework for me. Last night, I was trying to find a replacement for it. So Pank, what do I do? So I had to run some kind of a thing to find out the closest cousin of that ETF so that the portfolio runs. So that's what is happening. You know, when you get into the specialized niche sectors, and there are a lot of them. There's, there's the, the ETF NLR, Nuclear, Moo, M-O-U, Heller, Moo. 
I don't know why I'm looking at you. <laughs> agriculture, <laughs> agriculture ETF. It's a, it's a great performing scale and organic farm, you know. Shout out for her, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. great stuff. Yeah, and, and, and you have all these specialized ETFs and, and, and nano. What do you think nano would be? An ETF that invests in nanotechnology uh, companies, you know, and so on and so forth. And there's some say that we're going to see more of those, that there's going to get more specialized and more specialized, which, yeah. whether that's justified or not. Yeah. Yeah. Athlete ETF, exactly. Like Adrian, Foster. About, huh? Adrian Foster, is that who it is? Yeah. Yeah. So some of the most liquid ETFs, uh, many of them were well-known ETFs in the market, were ranked highly by the scoring algorithm, specifically like S&P was on the top. Many of the most liquid ETFs have at least five years of trading history, as I said before. 45 out of the top 50 have at least a billion in market cap, as I said before. And there were only 11 fixed income ETFs possible in the analysis, and 11 of the 50 were in the top, or 11 were in the top 50. So, as you can see, um, fixed income was popular in the ETF ranking. All top top three are all fixed income securities. The 50 ETFs that are considered the least liquid appear to be, target very specialized market segments. I think I went over, I think this is a double for some reason. That was my typo. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so in conclusion, the market is efficient enough to recognize undesirable features which causes trades to be minimal for at least liquid asset ETFs. The scoring algorithm allowed the ETFs in the study to be ranked in an order according to the best fit curve through an array of data that used the five factors of liquidity. Um, institutional traders should focus on the top deciles, most liquid ETFs if they require large positions in order to minimize liquidity risk and minimize market impact, a, a minimal market impact. A ranking system helps do this. There is a positive correlation between the bid-ask spread and expense ratio, which suggests that, both are factors, uh, that as both factors rise, investors have lower interest levels in the more expensive ETFs, which drives their volumes and liquidity to even lower levels. Any questions? That's pretty neat. <laughs> Shout out for Sean. And <laughs> M. That's nice. You, you are a forester, a science, econometrics, and realtor too. A license. Which company do you work for? Yuri Dawson. Oh, nice. Mr. Doherty. Oh, very nice. How about this? Yeah, forget that 20 years of manufacturing management. That's, yeah. that's not that. You know, he's a real up there. Yeah. <laughs> that's a weekend class. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. But you, you worked abroad, right, in, in engineering? I worked for ZF Limforder. Uh, we were building and designing and steering and suspension systems for the automotive industry. Yeah. Well, that's of experience, you know. Like I say, you know, the most learning that happens in a classroom is not from the person in front, it's from the person to the right, left, behind you, actually. There's tremendous resource, actually, in the class. 